Good evening, everybody. My name is Jay Ponteri, and I am the director of the Low Residency Creative Writing Program. Good evening, everybody. My name is Jay Ponteri. Um, sorry about that. Um, before I introduce our readers, we are, um, I'm gonna just say a little bit about um, what we have going on over the next 10 days. Um, we have readings and conversations tomorrow morning. Um, Brandon Shimoda and Allison C. Rollins will be in conversation at nine o'clock in the morning at specific standard time. And then tomorrow evening at seven o'clock, Brandon Shimoda and Sarah Jaffe will be reading. Um, that's again, 7 p.m. All times are Pacific here. Um, on Tuesday the 4th, um, we will have in the morning um, Bradshaw and myself conversing at 9 a.m. And then in the evening, um, that evening it'll be Pupe Misagi, Bradshaw and myself uh, reading at 7 p.m. That's on January 4th. And then uh, two other big things on January 11th, um, we have our guest artist, Vanita Blackburn. She will be reading at the Alberta Abbey and also live stream um, at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And um, our graduating student, James Hovius, will be reading on the 12th. Uh, so this residency, um, we are um, not doing any, we've in the past, we've done Zoom webinars, um, but we're, we're just doing Zoom meetings. So during the readings, um, if you, for those of you who aren't reading, um, when people start, if you could um, mute your cameras, um, but then like after people finish, you can flash your cameras back on and give them, the, give them a clap. Um, it's totally up to you. Um, you can type um, words of encouragement and praise in the chat. The readers, of course, won't be able to pay attention to them. We, we won't do, we don't do question and answer sessions. Um, so yeah, I think that's about it. I'm gonna introduce first Alejandro de Acosta and then Alejandro will read and then I'll be introducing uh, Allison C. Rollins. Um, all right, I'm so excited, y'all. Thank you for <laughs> attending. Thank you for attending. Our first reader is Alejandro de Acosta. Um, Alejandro is a teacher, writer, and translator in no particular order. He has translated philosophy and poetry from Spanish and French. He has also published two books of critical and experimental essays. His Muefa Poeme, a publishing project freely distributes poetry and prose, most recently focusing on works and translation. He also continues to help people make books through editorial feedback and other channels. He currently lives in Gainesville, Florida. Let's give a round of applause to Alejandro de Acosta. Thank you, Jay. Thanks everybody. Um, I'm going to uh, um, just briefly introduce what I'll be reading. I have uh, two sets of selections um, from uh, works by the Argentine writer, Ariel Lupino. If you heard me read the summer residency, I read The Beheaded by Ariel, and I'm going to be reading from his novel, Serbia or No Serbia, published by Klubhem. And um, I've translated the whole thing. I'll be reading um, part of one chapter and selections from two other chapters, uh, introducing the strange character of Grandpa Lobinovich. And then I'll be reading another text, which is unpublished, and was circulated in the context of the secret reading group called La Otra Caja, which we call Lok. And this text is called The Other Life. 
Um, it's a it's a considered a kind of a virtual writing program, as in computer software program. And so uh, Ariad encourages us to use it to write our own texts. And I consider this translation my own text. Okay. There we go. Grandpa Lovinovich fought Nazis. No lie. Honorable man, true grit. Grandpa Lovinovich crossed the step with a rifle on his shoulder. The straps pressed into his chest. He had dyspnea, dyspepsia, and physiological, mental, nervous disorders. But Grandpa Lovinovich never tired of walking like anthropoid. His steps could be tracked like the trajectory of a particle in a metastable liquid. Homeopath had given him proteins because he had pinworm in his intestine. On top of some lung disease and teeth decayed from tartar, Grandpa Lovinovich looked at the great and singular blue turquoise sky, not a singular cloud for his herbalist treatments. It made his Serbian heart mad with joy. Comrades smiled as if it were photo time. All partisans of Marshal Tito, the officers had leather hats with ear flaps as a sign of stupidity or mental superiority. But one night, Grandpa Lovinovich lost in the mountains in middle of firefight. They crossed path, Nazi patrol. In the meandering investigation, Grandpa Lovinovich fell into a cave and broke a leg, metatarsis. It cracked, a lot of pain, strong. But Grandpa Lovinovich pricked up his ears, hearing a strange sound. The firefight had stopped. It was not a Nazi soldier. Grandpa Lovinovich saw a bear in front of him, strong, rancid smell, and he had dried blood on his back and breathed with a hoarse sound. Story of Grandpa Lovinovich, very sad to tell, would rather not do it. Many will think lie, but a Lovinovich never lies. Really bad to lie, Serbs don't lie. Croats, maybe, not that I'm saying not, but what happened in cave that time, I tell true. Grandpa Lovinovich fought hand to hand with a bear. He had lipotoma or sebaceous cyst, bad leg due to a tremendous fall, plus liver failure plus congenital malformation in the pleural cavity. Bear stomped Grandpa Lovinovich into the ground, a blow Grandpa Lovinovich didn't see coming and couldn't dodge. Grandpa Lovinovich played dead, was almost dead, but it was a mistake. Bear didn't believe shit and struck face with claw. Smart animal, super clever Serbian bear. Why deny it? After what happened, Grandpa Lovinovich decided to go capybara hunting. Lots of capybaras in the Serbian steppe. In wicker baskets, peasant women carried cherries to make funeral liquor. But in the middle of a war, it was not a good idea to go out hunting. Grandpa Lovinovich would approach silently and kill them with a club, especially the little ones that would squeak like crazy. But one day, Grandpa Lovinovich was bitten by a giant capybara. His arm got infected and they almost had to amputate. Grandpa Lovinovich was put in an insane asylum due to trauma. He was really afraid of being injected with an air bubble or a shot of sodium pentothal. He said he was caught in the middle of an angelic war, a machinic war, a floral war. But we try to crack joke. It was an obsession, cracked one joke after another. Grandpa Lovinovich told good joke, very funny. I laughed a lot, asked him to tell it again. He had just told thousand times, didn't matter. I ask again, just one more time never got tired of listening to him. He never got tired of telling. Grandpa Lovinovich shook his head no and started over again. A Croatian hunter went to the woods to hunt Serbian bear. He pointed and missed shot. Serbian bear was close, right there. Croats really bad hunters. Bear looked at him, but didn't kill, didn't want to. And bear fucked the hunter. All of a sudden, no explanation. Another day, same Croatian hunter returned to the woods. Nothing. Another day, same Croatian hunter returned, aimed and missed shot. Bear fucked again. Third day, Croatian hunter returned to woods, aimed, fired, missed again. Serbian bear looked askance and said, Bear talked? You're not here to hunt. I laughed like crazy. But Grandpa Lovinovich was glum or sad. 
Years went by and I understood that Grandpa Lovinovich told own story in such funny joke. Bear had not killed him, had done something else. Hard to explain any other way. Grandpa Lovinovich raised the pain of life to the level of abstraction. And I laughed and Grandpa Lovinovich made a weird face. Croats attacked with little drones like mini birds. Must have bought them from the Chinese. On their own, they can't make a satelloid. I knew all too well. You thought they were mosquitoes and there were drones. First attacks didn't do anything too bad, a light skin itch, but in the long run, they gave you cancer. One attack, Grandpa Lovinovich, and he got eczema and inguinal boil. He had to get a lymphagionoidenography. And another broke two of his cervical vertebrae. It started taking out calcium and phosphorus bit by bit. Grandpa Lovinovich said that it was like when they poked you with a very thin needle. A little while back, he had had an arteriography. They never attacked alone, always in threes. Croats called that trident mode. I had to go buy cigarettes for Grandpa Lovinovich. I was always afraid of Croat attacks. Then I would go to the coffee shop to drink coffee with a little spoon. I drank all my coffee that way with a little aluminum spoon. Grandpa Lovinovich said that the waiter was a robot that seemed human. He spoke with him in a more, in a less informal, more hermetic manner. According to Grandpa Lovinovich, a Croat was operating him with a weird machine full of little buttons. Inside he had cables and electronics. If we open up his noggin, we can confirm, said Grandpa Lovinovich. I didn't want to try out of fear that he was right. Grandpa Lovinovich was no liar. Someone made a mini Grandpa Lovinovich replica to make him crazy. Sometimes Grandpa Lovinovich would see it out of the corner of his eye and sometimes he wouldn't. Double said he had to get divorced and kill Grandma Lovinovich, not that Grandma Lovinovich was the lover. Double said that Grandpa Lovinovich had to kill me before I was born. He told the story when I was little. None of it makes sense to us, but it does to the Croats. And they wanted Grandpa, Grandpa Lovinovich to act according to their intelligence. Grandpa Lovinovich was not going to lie about these matters. No one believes in double until you see it. At least that is what Grandpa Lovinovich said. Double is the same as us, but more infantile, whimsical. That is what Grandpa Lovinovich said, but I never knew if he meant it figuratively or literally. It was same as us, but barely visible, barely half a centimeter tall. And it yelled in horrible voice, ha, ah, ah, ha, ah. ha. Ah, really awful. Grandpa Lovinovich had to sleep on his back for 20 years because of the Croats. That's why I hate them so much. Grandpa Lovinovich was afraid they'd go in his ass. But if he slept on his back, couldn't they get in his mouth or nose or ears, not to mention eyes? If they emptied the sockets first, he would end up blind. Anyway, four holes instead of one was not a deal. But I didn't want to say that so as not to upset Grandpa Lovinovich or argue with him. Grandpa Lovinovich did what he could. Grandma Lovinovich was aware of the situation and took care of him. She could barely shut an eye all night due to hysteria, <laughs> hysterical, <laughs> hysterical diaphoretic crises. If Grandma Lovinovich fell asleep when morning came, Grandpa Lovinovich would wake her with a slap. And watch out if Grandpa Lovinovich woke up in the middle of this night due to a mosquito and found Grandma Lovinovich totally passed out. The machines drained Grandpa Lovinovich's blood. The Croats analyzed the samples in Chinese labs or in their own. They were using them to make another double to make him even crazier. But they weren't, <laughs> but weren't they making the double out of the remains of his own hysteria? That's what Grandpa Lovinovich said. But it was important not to take what Grandpa Lovinovich said literally. Grandpa Lovinovich's cerebral electricity had been diminished by the Croats and they erased memories with critical data. It wouldn't have been unlikely for them to have erased that with huge machines. It was as if the Croats were preparing for a holy war. They had 157 machines, each of a different shape, type, and size. One of them looked like a chalice made of crystal and alabaster. Sometimes they attacked with ultrasound. It was like the buzzing of the tiny drones, but it was something else. For starters, because it was an attack from afar. They attacked from Croatia without exposing themselves. They made you lose your balance and stumble. They did it so the guys at the coffee shop would laugh and so that we would fight each other or they would get you lost in the middle of Belgrade so that you didn't know where you were. They did terrible things. They would send you subliminal messages to get you to kill yourself or go crazy. Or they would speak to you like an echo, but with incomprehensible words. Or they would speak of lustful things in minute detail. 
They would also put coded messages in newspapers, but we would read them wrong because we thought they were for us and they were for them. Sometimes they would stick in a picture of Milosevic to confuse you. Even those of us who had figured this out made this rookie error. Croats wanted to make a shooting range out of Belgrade so they could test their weapons. They would put ideas in our heads as if they were writings. Even the apparently intrepid waiter was programmed by Croats. Maxim, Julio, friend of my father, once shared a revelation I later found in a novel by Sayer. Gamblers don't play to win, but to keep on gambling. Likewise, a writer doesn't write so as to find success or recognition, but to keep on writing. And that's where we're at. Last night. Last night, a translator of Stephen King's work notably resembling the Argentine writer César Aida, told us that Pizarnik was looking for the most precious word combination, for example, mirror and moon. And that is why when she ran out of combinations, all she could do was kill herself. For this translator, Pizarnik's suicide was a botched suicide attempt because no one who really wants to kill herself has to try it three times. Three axes. This text is written from three axes, writing, rewriting, and translation. History of XYZ, heteronym of my mother's true son, written by my mother's false son. XYZ lived in the outskirts of the ghetto, usually in terrible conditions, with a neurological problem, in a house overly full of furniture, whose electrical wiring was consistently defective. XYZ had a German pastor and ate in a Chinese restaurant. He studied abroad and described the robotic wars of the future from his perspective. In Beijing, he witnessed a machine cut off the head of a worker in a home appliance factory. Many were surprised by this story. They thought that it was a rare accident in a society as highly technological as the Chinese. On the contrary, it was an event that happened with a frightening regularity. Story written by XYZ where that whole thing about how no one writes better than my mother's true son is belied. The robots had found a kind of road. They shot through the third eye they had mounted on their foreheads. The robots began to slowly spread out in the bay. They crossed a gently rushing river and set up shop on splendid ground. Robot A inserted the robocock in robot B's stomach. In making the sign of the cross, robot C was left without an arm. He tried implacably to retain the idea of technological esotericism. At this point in the story, it's worthwhile to pause. This experience could be used to know more about the robots. The robots had metal points that resembled long beards. For more than one of them, this was a mysterious issue. The robots had been accepted just as they had been made by the corporation that had ordered them. The scientist who designed them was put in an operating room and later received general anesthesia. Robot D fired a laser. It was hard to find an attack vector. So the fight went like this. Robot E functioned without notoriously harmful effects. When robot F saw robot G appear for the eighth time, he wanted to destroy him. Robot F destroyed robot G with a laser. Robot D maneuvered in a simultaneously predictable and unpredictable way, and he was not destroyed. Robot H was lost in the middle of the city. Robot I moved through the subway. Robot B's counterattack mechanisms weren't working. Meanwhile, robot A struggled with robot C. Robot F was struck down. The robots had emerged from the center of the earth. Translation. This text was written in an invented language and translated without the help of any kind of dictionary. Big essay on the writing machine. According to Laiseca, Marcelo Fox was beheaded by the Mitre Line subway in the Belgrano Ere station. Setting out from that event, I was able to derive a series of conclusions. Texts are not written with ideas, but with phrases, first one, then another, and so forth. There is a logic of the inside and a logic of the outside, but you can't understand the inside with the logic of the outside. Most literary problems are topological. There is a concept of writing on the order of composition, 
it's not a matter of thinking writing as music, but rather understanding both of them as formal expressions. The word literature does not allow us to think writing. The goal of literature is nothing other than that of a certain ambiguous and confused concept of writing. Writing is irreducible to narrating or telling. You can't defend ideologically what fails in formal terms. A text doesn't tell a story, but ways of telling. The author is not dead. He must be beheaded. There is only writing. There was never anything else. A text is not written to be understood, but to be affected by a form. We should stop talking about writing and begin talking about writings. The word rereading should be forbidden. We have never already read a text. One who explains, the one who explains is lost. There is nothing to explain. Leave understanding to those who understand. No one knows. No one knows what a text can do. Writing produces a biological effect in the human body. Otro texto. A text cannot be translated. The translation is another text. Thank you for listening, everybody. Alejandro, thank you so much. Wonderful, thank you. Our next reader is Allison C. Rollins, lead faculty of low residency creative writing at PNCA at Willamette. Allison, born and raised in St. Louis City, is a 2019 National Endowment for the Arts Literature Fellow. Her work has appeared or is forthcoming in American Poetry Review, Iowa Review, New England Review, The New York Times Magazine, and elsewhere. Kave Kanam and Kaolu Fellow. She is a 2016 recipient of the Poetry Foundation's Ruth Lilly and Dorothy Sargent Rosenberg Fellowship. 2018, she was the recipient of a Rona Jaffe Writers Award and in 2020, the winner of a Pushcart Prize. She holds a Master of Library and Information Science from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign and has held faculty as well as librarian appointments at various institutions, including the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and Colorado College. Her debut poetry collection, Library of Small Catastrophes, published by Copper Canyon, was a 2020 Hurston Wright Foundation Legacy Award nominee. Let's welcome Allison C. Rollins and Nate, Nate Marshall. Thank you so much, Jay. So for my reading this evening, I'm gonna be reading in community with Jay Ponteri and my partner, Nate Marshall. Um, these are gonna be a selection of excerpts from a manuscript that I'm working on called The Red Curator. And the manuscript is in conversation with Dion Brand's um, The Blue Clerk and also the documentary film called The Price of Everything. So there are multiple voices. I think of it kind of as a polyphonic play poem at the moment. And um, so there are multiple characters or roles, but for this session, um, we're going to be introduced to the character, the curator, which will be read by Jay, the character of the artist, which will be read by Nate, and then I will be functioning as kind of a narrator. So I'm going to screen share to make it a little bit easier, hopefully, to, um, to get a sense of the experimental realm we're entering, and you'll hear this collection of voices. 
the red curator. There is the collector that is the wolf in sheep's clothing, and then there's the sheep in wolf's clothing. Stefan Edlis, art collector, the price of everything. My only defense against fate is color. Larry Poon's artist, the price of everything. Zero. It was red inside the wolf. Not dark, but red. A red reading room, if you will. The curator uses the wolf's rib cage as an archive. Each bone a shelf. The crimson cloaked curator is with child. The child is a work of art. The child is becoming an artist. The artist is indebted to the curator. The curator will be survived by the artist. The curator and the artist look after each other. The dispossessed as possessed, to have and to hold in the hold of a wolf. 0 0.25. Given that the architecture of truth is not structurally sound, you might be curious regarding the wolf's dimensions, the actual size of the space the artist and curator occupy. It's impossible to say. However, a lack of knowledge equates to an abundance of possibility. The room of the wolf has infinite corners. 0.5. The red light inside the wolf is from the sun. The sun is a lamp, a potato powered light bulb. The curator has fashioned this light source using one large potato, two pennies, two zinc plated nails, three pieces of copper wire and a red light bulb. The curator is the light. It would seem the light comes from the curator's hands. 1.0. Where am I from? Here. Where is here? A wolf. What is a wolf? An animal. Am I an animal? Yes and no. Where was I before I was here? Outside. How did we get from here? How did we get here from outside? The mouth of no return. What is the mouth of no return? A hole, or rather a threshold. Can we go back outside? The only way out is in. If I am from here, where did you come from? A body. What is a body? A, a body is blue. What is blue? Blue is a feeling. What is a feeling? A feeling is an ocean. What is an ocean? An ocean is alive. I would like to be alive. You are. How long have we been here? Length of time is immeasurable. To tell time is to watch a pool of water's face, to read the concentric circles as an interrupted train of thought. If time is like a spiral, how old are we? Age old. If you are age old, what age am I? Timeless. What should I call you? I don't know. A collector, I suppose. Is that your name? No, my name is Curator. What is my name? Artist. 3.5, curator, noun. A guardian, one who has care or superintendence of something. Late 14th century, curator, a parish priest, from Latin curator, overseer, manager, guardian. Agent noun from curatus, past participle of curare, see cure, verb from early 15th century in reference to those put in charge of minors, lunatics, etc., meaning officer in charge of a museum, library, etc., is from 1660s, related curatorship. 3.75. You might be wondering what the artist and curator eat. The answer is mushrooms and beets. 
As their hunger grows, they beat each other over the head. How many beats per day is unclear. Take comfort in knowing that they have not resorted to the horrors of cannibalism, at least not in any traditional sense. Mushrooms belong to a kingdom all their own. 4.4. Is there a distinction between who I am and what I do? Somewhat. Are you and I related? We are interrelated. What does interrelated mean? Reciprocally or mutually related. I meant to ask if there are, is a blood relation between us. We are related by bond, not by blood. Can you be more candid? I can, I did. Are you trying to fool me? In trying to fool you, I also fool me. What type of, art, what type of response is that? An answer. 5.0. Not an answer, but an entrance the shape of an animal like me. Ocean Vong, time is a mother. 5.5. Before the artist was born, the curator was an author. Upon the artist's entrance into the world, the author turned authority, became a curator. The curator is an authority figure. A father? No. A mother father. 8.0, author, noun, mid 14th century, octor, otter, otter, father, creator, one who brings about, one who makes or creates someone or something. From old French, octor, actior, author, originator, creator, instigator, 12th century modern French, auteur, and directly from Latin, octor. Promoter, producer, father, progenitor, builder, founder, trustworthy writer, authority, historian, performer, doer, responsible person, teacher, literally one who causes to grow. Agent noun from Octus, past participle of Augier, to increase. 8.3. The curator believes in daily ritual. Three times a day, the curator and artist stop everything. They then touch their head, heart, and hands to the red walls of the wolf. They do this as an ongoing act of thanksgiving. 8.57. The wolf is a performance space. Behind the red velvet curtain is a theater of the confined. Rehearsals are nonstop. To rehearse is to practice. Practice does not make perfect. Perfection is impossibly possible. 8.62, confine. Verb, used with object, confines, confining. To enclose within bounds, limit or restrict. She confined her remarks to errors in the report. Confine your efforts to finishing the book. Two, to shut or keep in, prevent from leaving a place because of imprisonment, illness, discipline, etc. For that offense, she was confined to quarters for 30 days. Noun, three, usually confines, a boundary or bound, limit, border, frontier. Four, often confines, region, territory. Five, archaic, confinement. Six, obsolete, a place of confinement, prison. 8.99. I want to make a series. I want to make the same thing over and over again. The curator tells me not to kill time with such nonsense, that each work of art should be unique, rare, an act of invention. I must repeatedly practice, yet my work cannot be repetitive. I am tasked with creating cutting edge works that simultaneously maintain the signature style of my past. I must reinvent, be both old and new, recycled and fresh. As a result, I'm slowly losing my mind. 9.13. Can I ask you a question? You just did. I honestly don't have the headspace for sarcasm right now. Fine, but you take yourself far too seriously. What's the issue now? The curator said I am wasting my life. I think you misheard them. Well, 
Correct me if I'm wrong. What did they say then? You are wasting your light. How do I continue to live with myself if I believe such a thing to be true? Sounds like a personal problem. I personally am beside myself with joy. Keep telling yourself that if you want to. I will. I feel like I'm having an out of body experience. Now you get it. Why do I fear my own shadow? For the same reason you dread your echo? It's because I'm trapped, caged in this cave. Is a cave not a womb we emerge from safely? It doesn't help that I'm lonely. Lonely, but never alone. 9.17, lonely, ain't it? Yes, but my lonely is mine. Toni Morrison, Sula. 9.25, the sky is red today. The sky was red yesterday. The sky will be red tomorrow. 9.32, red is always good. Stefan Edlis, The Price of Everything. 11.0, withdrawn, the curator makes decisions. Daily, the curator gathers the artist's work to make critical choices. The things omitted outnumber the things kept. On the other side of safekeeping is exile. On the other side of exile is freedom. 11.2. Do you love me? I can't say. You can't or you won't? I won't. Do you like me? That is a question of taste. Do I have taste? I am a taste maker. You are a reflection of me. 11.25. As we venture further, the curator fears that they are losing you. They can sense you growing hot and bothered. To offer refreshment, the curator has installed an apparatus to promote better circulation, to air out confusion's sour stench. You will now find that suspended from your disbelief is a ceiling fan. The sharp blades are paper thin. The turn of each page is the rebirth of cool. 11.3. It is my duty to appraise. I must determine the artist's worth and by extension, the worth of the collection. Self-worth is attached to self-preservation. Everything has a price, a cost, a value. Care is connected to value. We only protect art that is valuable and thus it in turn survives. This becomes our legacy, evident we were here. 11.56. You speak often of how my art makes no money. What is money? Money is a construct. How does a construct come to be? It is built. Built with what? Ideas. How are ideas maintained? With constant buy-in. Is there money inside the wolf? No. Was that your idea? Yes. How will I know my worth? You won't, but you'll get the idea. 11.6. I will never know how you see red, and you will never know how I see it. Ann Carson, Autobiography of Red. 11.75. I'm no longer sure I can trust the curator. The curator told me that they are a collector. I think the curator lied. It has recently come to my attention that perhaps the curator is in fact a critic. Is a collector the same as a critic? If not, what is the difference? 13.1, the curator pretends they are living in the post-color world, a realm of red singularity. The curator has both a limited and vast imagination. A nation is made via the imagination of its people, 
A word contains a world. A nation is a worldview, a smaller view of the larger world. The curator views the wolf as a nation state. The artist is the state of the nation. 13.23. I overheard you while talking to the curator. What did you overhear? Your plans to kill them. I never said that. I would never even think to say something like that. You didn't say it aloud. You said it to me. Please don't tell. Don't let the curator find out. For, for the meantime, your secret is safe with me. We will wait for the meantime when you are murderously mad. That's ridiculous, complete and utter nonsense. You utter a lot. Well, what else have you heard? It's more what I have noticed than what I have heard. What have you noticed? You hear with your eyes and see with your ears. Is that not what it means to be an artist? You tell me. I thought so. You thought or were told? Who knows? 13.33. The highest truth is one and the same with the absurd. C.G. Jung, The Red Book. 13.5. The artist is misunderstood. The artist's wild attempts at experimentation are deemed absurd. The curator writes the artist's behavior off as an avant-garde phase. Daily, the curator urges the artist to make art, not anarchy. 13.9, avant-garde, noun. French, literally advance guard. Used in English 15th century to 18th century in a literal military sense. Borrowed again 1910 as an artistic term for pioneers or innovators of a particular period. Also used around the same time in a political sense in communist and anarchist publications as an adjective by 1925. 13.99. Be original. Strive for advancement. Make art that will take us forward. I apologize if I've held us back. There's no need to apologize for being stagnant. It, it might help if I knew what exactly original art is. I know originality when I see it. So you've seen it before? No, precisely the opposite. Something original would be something special that I've never encountered. Am I original? You are priceless. Am I in original? A priceless work of art warrants the ultimate price. Am I the ultimate price? I think you are confusing price with value. What is more valuable, my art or me? 14.2, the artist draws from their red heart. The artist's red heart is a red table upon which the curator feasts. 14.33, Red Heart, Red Heart, Red Heart, Toni Morrison, Beloved. 15.0. You were living off of me. No, you were living off of me. What about the wolf? What about the wolf? We are parasites. Both of us are living off of the wolf. The wolf is hosting us as guests. Then we are con artists, taking advantage of the wolf's hospitality. You are the only artist. I am merely a facilitator. Is facilitator another word for accomplice? I follow your lead. I have no choice but to follow you. The world is unfair. How can you not see that this is an abusive relationship? Since when is generosity seen as abuse? There is no reciprocity. All you ever do is take, take, take. I am equitable. It is complimentary to take what is given. That is a lie. You will never get away with this. We already have.
15.1, autotroph, an organism that can produce its own food using light, water, carbon dioxide, or other chemicals, known as producers because they are able to make their own food from raw materials and energy. All food chains start with some type of autotroph or producer. Heterotroph, an organism that eats other plants or animals for energy and nutrients, known as consumers because they consume producers or other consumers. The term stems from the Greek word hetero for other and trough for nourishment. 15.37. The curator attempts to fulfill their lifelong mission to find the right words, the words to define red. They hopelessly search for the correct medium through which to convey how red feels to the touch, how red smells, how it tastes, how it sounds. Even though language is grossly imprecise, the curator draws various conclusions. 15.43. The artist wants to create outside the curator's box, but blue is forbidden. The artist desires to paint an ocean with the color found beneath their skin. The artist was taught to work with what they have. Be resourceful. In search of blue, the artist travels to the liquid land of blood. Yet again, the artist finds only red. 15.5. I have held on to my recipe for red for dear life. I have access to an increasingly limited supply of uh, coach, coach, sorry, I'm mispronouncing that, uh, cochineal as well as cream of tartar. Due to their parasitic nature, I have a dwindling amount of the insects as well as the cacti that they live and feed on. I do want the artist to be worried with I'm sorry, I do not want the artist to be worried with such concerns, but this really necessitates an increased urgency for their work. 16.9. Are you more invested in my process or the product? What do you mean? Do you care more about my craft or the end result? I'm only interested in art. Yes, but when will I know when I have arrived at art? When I say so. How do you know the difference between arriving and arrived? Right now you are emerging, but someday you will have emerged. I don't understand. Please explain this to me. It is a matter of time, accomplishment, and countless other variables too complex to get into. 18.55. I am exhausted. I am overwhelmed. I create until I am depleted. I catalog beyond my capacity. I am empty. I am stuffed. I start again from nothing. The archive is overflowing. I cannot keep inventing fire. I cannot let the fire die. Do you see smoke? No room remains. I am too full. 19.0. What is conceptual art? Unreal? 20.77. Today, I choreographed a coronation, a dream dance, silent. I stood still, motionless enough to fragment my limbs into positions of grotesque beauty. I made shapes in the air with my feet. I crowned myself with gestures. Yesterday, I made a bowl from red clay. I spent hours on the bowl's ornamentation. The bowl is designed to hold in permanence. The contents of the bowl are invisible. This greatly displeased the curator. Tomorrow, I will compose a song of ephemera, a melody of notes that eat each other whole. The curator is never satisfied. I might as well make what I want. 22.21. Today, the artist asked me if I am a god. I responded with the sound for the word false. I am a curator, not a god. I help to make the artist's art possible. Then I, in turn, curate what the artist creates. 
In other words, I make the artist's art into an art of my own. I take and give life everlasting. 23.9. At times, the curator finds the artist unsettling. When this occurs, the curator asks the artist to settle down. The curator acted as a settler in making the wolf their home. They did this in the hopes that the artist would always feel settled. 24.26. Curation is a system of desire. I grow nostalgic as I fondle the contents of my collection. Nostalgia is moist. Moisture leads to mold. Mold is my mortal enemy. Mold's manifesto is cannibalism. Mold aims to colonize. Mold, that vile villain, wishes to occupy all that I hold dear. My principal occupation is to be meticulous. I must ensure the archive is never occupied, that it never becomes a colony. I will not let mold rot me out. 32.17. I'm concerned we are hurting the wolf. There is no harm in merely inhabiting. Is it possible to inhabit without domination? The wolf acts as a preserve. We are in the wolf's domain, not the other way around. Which position has more power, inside or outside? Inside. So the wolf is not in power. We are. You forget that sanctuary is offered, not taken. 32.32. Which do you seek? A, refuge. B, preserve. C, sanctuary. D, asylum. And for the sake of time, I think I will end there. Thank you so much to my complimentary readers, Jay and Nate. And I look forward to being in conversation with Brandon tomorrow morning about this experiment in part. Oh my gosh, that was so great. Thank you so much, Allison and Nate. Wonderful. Let's give a vigorous snap clap. That was so cool. Thank you so much for collaborating, for, for including um, multiple people. That was really cool. Um, thank you everybody for your attention. Um, and for those of you out on the live YouTube uh, stream, um, Brandon Shimoda and Allison C. Rollins will be in conversation tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And then tomorrow night, Brandon Shimoda and Sarah Jaffe are reading at 7 p.m. Uh, hope to see you all. Thank you so much.